Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast, where we dissect the mindsets and tactics of the true beast of business. People like Gary Vee, Grant Cardone, and Warren Buffett, all to create a blueprint to experience life more abundantly. Hello, everybody. Today's guest is a true powerhouse in real estate investing. He owns a company called Region Home Buyers and has done well over 300 transactions in the Northwest Indiana area. Anything from fix and flips, rentals, private lending, and wholesaling. He also hosts a monthly meetup teaching over 100 other people how to reach their real estate investing goals every single month. So I can't wait to introduce you guys to Justin Smits. So, Justin, thank you again so much for coming on to the podcast. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we think it's going to be so valuable, especially to all the people that want to get into real estate because, you know, they say like wholesaling is the first step. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. before we get into all of that, um, our guests, they have to explain their story for our audience. Okay. So I spent um, almost 15 years as an auto mechanic and uh, did really well at that actually. And um, and at the end of 2011, um, even though I was doing pretty well, um, kind of, you know, learned and heard about tax sale investing from a a tool supplier actually, a guy who sold me tools every week. And uh, he had made some some pretty good money at it. And he was like, you should go check it out. So I did, I checked out a few tax sales and just kind of, you know, watched and, then decided to kind of jump into it and uh, partnered up with a guy I was already working with. And we started off, we bought a couple tax liens and those ended up turning into houses that were pretty, pretty good deals. And um, I mean, when we started, we were so experienced, like we thought like paying cash, mean you had, you had to like bring actual cash. So like we went to the bank and got like $20,000, like and the people at the County for the tax liens were like, what are you guys doing? Like you can bring a cashier's check. And like, I didn't know any better, you know, so that's how inexperienced I was. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. You know, we, we started bidding on hundreds of tax liens at a time um, over the years and then started rehabbing um, houses, keeping some as rentals, doing some owner finance, uh, still while we were both working full time. And um, in 2015, I had a hand injury, uh, unrelated to work actually. Um, and I was gonna be off for about nine months. And uh, wasn't really sure what I was going to do it myself and uh, kind of watched a few videos on wholesaling, had heard about it, um, but didn't really know what it was um, and, and watched some stuff from Sean Terry and uh, just said, you know what, we're going to do this. So um, I started posting ads in Facebook groups because it's free. You know, when you start out, you got to do whatever you can. That's cheap because you don't have the budget. Um, and uh pretty much right away, uh, we got a deal probably within a couple weeks, maybe a couple days. And it was all the way in Michigan, believe it or not, even though, you know, we're in here in Indiana. Mm-hmm. And um, crazy enough, we went there, we bought the house. Um, we actually closed on it because it was far away. It was, it, was a, it was a pretty cheap house anyways. And um, we were going to just resell the thing. And I posted it in another Facebook group before we drove up there to cut the grass. And a guy was like, Hey, I used to work on that house 30 years ago. I'll give you double what you paid for it. And, um, I couldn't believe it. So I was kind of hooked from that time. Um, I ended up having the hand surgery and probably two days, uh, post-op. Um, I was already at appointments. I had my business partner and his wife actually driving me to appointments because I had hand and foot surgery at the same time. Wow. Um, I was like, there was just no excuses. I was going to make it happen one way or another. And um, did that for probably six, seven months. And just kind of as proof of concept that I felt good with it, that, um, you know, that I could really do it. Um, Because I was, I was already at a job where I was making, you know, $150,000 a year. So when I was pretty comfortable, um, I had a lot to lose. I had a family, I had kids. And, um, you know, my employer kept saying, when are you going to come back? And finally, one day I told him, I said, well, you guys really need me more than I need you. And um, I quit. (laughs) And um, it was a little scary. You know, I mean, it's, you know, if you don't have a whole lot to lose, you know, it's easy to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Um, But I had a lot to lose. I had a good job. I was kind of comfortable. Life was pretty easy for me, honestly. Um, Real estate's probably a lot more work. Uh, a lot more hours for sure, you know, but, uh, 
I just, I really love the freedom of it. I liked being out, meeting people, working with people, solving their problems. You know, the money kind of comes with it. We all love making money. That's great. But um, I really enjoyed uh, what I did with it. I had kind of lost my love for being a mechanic. So um, just went full time then. And, um, you know, over the years, you know, my business model kind of changed. I ended up changing partners. As you guys know, I'm with Adrian now. Yep. And um, we are, well, at least in history, been primarily wholesale. We still try to do that. Um, but we are rehabbing a little bit more as the market has changed and um, don't really have much of a choice. You need to kind of rehab to kind of stay competitive um, because there is a lot of competition right now, you know? So that's where we're at today. Awesome. And it's actually funny that you bring up that, um, that point of the competitive market. Uh, what are some of the strategies or techniques or like just the mindsets that you guys take on at region home buyers that help you to stay competitive in uh, this market that we're in now? Yeah. I mean, um, quite honestly, right now, everybody and their brother's an investor, right? So yeah, um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's easy to get deals. It's, it's not, it is difficult. Um, you know, there's more competition than ever. Um, guys are, paying premiums for houses um, because they're trying to do more volume than profitable deals, uh, which is also dangerous in my opinion. And we kind of got caught up in that for a while too. Um, but for us, what's kind of, you know, really made a huge impact on our business um, because we aren't the highest offer typically. I mean, typically we might be in the middle or at the bottom as far as pricing. Um, but branding has been strong with us, our online presence, people know us, they see us, um, you know, when you look at our reviews, we probably have 100 plus reviews that are positive online. Our next competitor might have two or three. So if you're dealing with a seller that's really going to make a price-based decision, we may not win that deal, um, but most people don't. They want to trust who they work with. Um, and quite often we're getting deals at lower prices than other people um, because they trust us and they want to work with somebody that they trust. And money isn't important you know, depending on the situation. Yeah. And, uh, so branding has been important um, for us. Integrity has always been kind of, you know, real important in our business. Um, the, the one thing that's different about us is that we are okay with, and we will close on pretty much every property we buy. Um, even if our intent is to just resell it, wholesale it, whatever. Um, so we don't, we don't really back out of deals. We don't renegotiate typically. Um, so people know that, that we're a, that we're a good company to work with. Um, and the other thing is, is having relationships, right? Like, um, you know, I think that's one thing, you know, you, you can spend a million dollars a year on marketing, but some of your best deals and the ones that you have little competition on come from relationships, come from yeah, people sure. that you network with and attorneys and other wholesalers and, you know, from our meetup group and different things. And those don't cost you huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're, we're in a difficult time. And there's plenty of deals out there for everybody. I mean, uh, I'm not one of those guys that's like, hey, there's no deals out there yet. Yeah, yeah it is tougher. Mm -hmm. uh, you just got to dig for them. They're out there, you know? Yeah, sure. And so, like, how do you stay competitive with the rising number of wholesalers? Um, is it because you already branded yourself or are there other factors too? I think branding has a lot to do with it. Um, Part of the difficulty is for us, you know, just being honest is um, our competition really is in other wholesalers. Our competition has really become end buyers. Um, and because they all want to do huge amounts of volume, they've just decided to start sending direct mail and doing online advertising and all those sort of things. Um, so they're basically coming in as a wholesaler, but then they're offering what I'll call, you know, wholesale retail price. So, um, you know, if, if far as competing with other wholesalers, that's not really a challenge for us, I would say. You know, it probably sounds a little arrogant, but most of my competition comes from people that are end buyers. They're going to keep it as a rental. They're going to turnkey it. They're going to flip it. Um, and because they need the volume, they are offering, you know, as high as they need to be, you know, to, to basically get it. So um, that is a little bit hard to compete with. It is. And um, so the branding is important. Our reputation definitely is important. Uh, we're trying to find deals that other people aren't finding because they can't or they won't or they won't work hard enough to get them. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we've had to adapt a little bit. We're rehabbing a little bit more. I think, um, 
you know, being able to adapt to the changing market has definitely helped. Um, you know, just a lot of different things. It, it definitely hasn't been easy. I mean, it's not one of those things where it's, you know, it's any one thing you really gotta, you gotta be kind of a chameleon and be able to change. And, yeah. um, you know, what, what we did last week or last year or six months ago isn't working. You know, we've, we've changed a lot of our business. So that's awesome. And you also mentioned that every property um, that you acquire, unlike, you know, traditional wholesaling where you put it under co contract and you sell the contract, mm -hmm. you actually close on it. Can you m mention why uh, you decided to go that route? Because to me, I don't know if this is true or not, but to me, it actually sounds like a little bit more work. So uh, just tell us what made you want to close on properties and then resell them uh, as a wholesaler, as opposed to just putting it on a contract. Sure. I mean, that's a great question. We get it a lot because a lot of people think we're pretty stupid for it, honestly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I guess for us, it, it started off with integrity. That's one of our core values in our business. So when we go to a house and we say we're going to buy the house, we're going to buy it. Um, so we're confident that we can buy that house, you know, whether it's wholesale, retail, you know, rehab, whatever. Yeah. Um, we're going to put our, our, our money where our mouth is. We're not going to back out on them. Um, and the integrity piece kind of came into play because, you know, when you go to a wholesale appointment, you basically, you, you have to lie to them and tell them that you're a buyer really, right? Because, you know, if you're not and you're going to wholesale it, then, you know, your only intent is to sign that, uh, assign that contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to tell them, hey, it's my quote unquote partners need to see the house and all these different things. And, um you know, it just didn't sit well with us the way we run our business. And yeah. quite honestly, it is more work. It is more work. It is more hassle. It also results in some losses where we probably could have just backed out of a contract if our intent was to only assign it. Um, but that also allows us to do what we say we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, we've got some deals that other companies, um, actually friends of mine, have backed out of. Um, at the last minute and asked for renegotiating, uh, you know, at a lower price. And the people told them, you know, kick rocks, I'm not going to sell it to you. And they've sold it to us for the exact same price that the, the other company wanted it for. Wow. You know, a recent example of that, they had it under contract, um, I think at maybe like 114 or 115. And, you know, was supposed to close in two weeks, didn't, ended up trying to renegotiate the guy at the last minute down in like the 80s. And the guy was like, absolutely not. That's crazy. Like they tried to pressure the guy, you know, the day before closing and he was like, Justin, we'll sell it to you. My offer was considerably less than the original offer. And we just resold it. And I think we made 40 or $45,000. And you know, the guy just, he didn't want to deal with the other company because they hadn't come through for him. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, it is, it does create some problems. It creates logistic, logistical problems. It creates, you know, insurance and utilities and, um, so part of its integrity, the other piece is we take our time to sell properties. I am not in a hurry. Um, I don't have a contract date. I can get as many people as I want through it. I have done open houses. I have done barbecues at houses for buyers. Like we get to do cool things that you can't really do. Um, and we're just different. We're different with it and it works for us and it's not for everybody. You know, it's not, it's definitely, I don't suggest that everybody go closing on houses instead of assigning contracts. In fact, that's the last thing I would tell people to do unless, unless you're ready to lose money because it happens, mm -hmm. you know, but it really works for us. I think people respect it. They think we're crazy, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, my next question is, um, we always mention, you know, this market is rising, it's becoming more competitive and um, there's always this notion out there. Well, it's not really a notion. It's really, it's going to happen. Just nobody knows when that um, because all these uh, rising prices, uh, you know, rising interest rates, more competition, you know, every, every time that happens, it's kind of an indicator that the market is going to decline uh, very soon. And with you being in wholesale, I wanted to know if, you believe that would be better or worse for your business and um what how do you plan to to attack that situation when that time actually comes 
so we all know that time is coming. I mean, there's no denying it when it's going to come. I mean, no, none of us know. I mean, it's, you know, it, is it near probably, um, you know, I, I tend to think that the Midwest, you know, maybe especially Indiana's insulated a little bit better. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, because, you know, Illinois is right next door and they suck. So everybody's <laughs> coming here. Yeah. Uh, so I tend to think we're in a little bit better position than a lot yeah. of other markets. Um, that's my personal opinion. Um, so when we do take a hit, I don't think it'll be as significant as some of the other markets, you know, like our friends in, you know, Jersey and New York and California, they've been taking hits and, you know, for the last year, it's already changed there. Oh, really? Um, yeah. I mean, they're doing huge price reductions. They're, you know, really looking differently at things because things really hit the coast and in the, in the, in the big markets before it hits us, you know? Yeah. Um, so yes, it's coming. Um, how will we um, kind of deal with that? Um, you know, we've, we've had this conversation, Adrian and I have, um, because we know it's coming. Uh, and we know that, you know, because everybody and their brother is a rehabber right now or a wholesaler, you know, or whatever, um, you know, the seas are going to be parted and there's, you know, there's going to be blood in the streets and a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. Um, doing bad deals and get caught with their pants down and those people are going to go away. Um, our core buyers, um, the core investors, they're still going to be around, I think, and they're going to go into buying mode. Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity for us to really provide um, them with inventory and probably ourselves too, because uh, I really wasn't around at the last crash. I wish I was because, you know, I'd, I'd, have a lot, I'd have a lot more money, a lot more rentals and things. I would have held on to some stuff, you know, if I could have bought it, you know, where it was then. Um, so again, I think we're just going to have to adapt. Um, we're going to lose a lot of buyers, a lot of buyers, you know, we're not going to do as many deals. You're going to have to be patient. You have to wait it out a couple of years. You know, I think having relationships with, um, with, you know, private money lenders, if you use private money, um, or other investors that you can do deals with and hold on to things and be ready for that change. Um, as long as you're ready for it and you're prepared, I think you're going to be good. If you think things are going to continue to, you know, keep getting better and better and better and better and, better and it's never going to go away. Well, <laughs> the, the time is coming, you know. Yeah, definitely. For sure. <laughs> um, and then you mentioned in buyers a lot throughout the podcast already. So how is it that um, you find your end buyers? Um, so most of ours are actually relationships. Um, we have not uh, marketed for buyers um, until a postcard that we sent out recently in probably two years. Um, so we don't even look for buyers. Um, typically they find us, whether it's through our meetup group, um, or just having deals, you know, um, we just, we don't look for buyers. I mean, most of the time they're, they're looking for us. I mean, um, and, and this is probably going to sound bad, but everybody and their brother has a hundred thousand dollars in their bank account these days is what it seems like. So, yeah. Um, when people tell me they're like a cash buyer, I'm like, yeah. And so is my grandma. She's buying houses these days, you know, like, so buyers are everywhere right now. Um, so I don't think finding buyers is really an issue if you have a deal. So um, really finding deals is what's harder for us right now. Um, we just, we can't even supply our buyers with enough stuff. I mean, we have thousands of buyers, you know, and then probably a, a core amount of, you know, 20 to 25 that are real serious, legit buyers. A couple of them buy anywhere between 50 and hundred houses a year. And, probably about 10 of them do. Um, and that's why they're actually sending direct mail and doing online stuff and everything right now and trying to get, you know, in a position to buy where we are, not necessarily at the prices, but just because of volume, because they need inventory. Yeah. So, you know, if you're starting out, you're looking for buyers, um, you know, just go network, you know, go to networking events, you know, get out there, meet people, um, you know, drive around a neighborhood, see where they're, where there's houses where they're working and there's contractors there and stop and talk to people and, you know, see what they're doing and what their rehab costs are, if they're willing to share it and, you know, what they're looking for and provide some value and try to find them a house, you know, something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think one thing that drives me nuts is, you know, I get contacted by a ton of wholesalers and they're like, yeah, can I put you on my buyer's list? And I'm like, well, what do you have? And they're like, well, nothing. I just went to a three day event over the weekend and they told me to like go home for buyers, you know, and it's like, yeah, I mean, I understand you're doing what you were told, but uh, if you have a deal, buyers will come. For sure. 
Yeah. And so do you think that, um, like for someone that's just getting started, um, they have a great deal and they haven't really networked as much. Do you think that it would be like a good idea to post it into Facebook groups kind of like you did starting out? Yeah. I mean, it's free, it's cheap, it's easy. Everybody's on Facebook. You know, um, I think there's a higher population of cash home buyers on Facebook um, than there is Snapchat, Instagram, any of those things. Now we use all of those, but I think your, your, your core group of people with money that are actual buyers are probably Facebook users. Cause they might, you know, they might be baby boomers age or, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're in their forties and those tend to be Facebook users. So I think it's a great place. I mean, people are on Facebook. I mean, we're all attached to our phones all day. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And so uh, you also mentioned a couple times about your meetup and a lot of people want to know about that as well as myself uh, <laughs> because um, I've seen you and a couple other people start meetups and kind of like you said before, everything kind of just attracts to you. Like everything kind of, you know, comes your way instead of you going out and having to like go to a ton of networking events. Cause we go to a ton of networking events, but, um, you could go to one and just because you host it, like everybody knows who you are. And I believe that's truly, truly powerful. Uh, what are some tips that you have for people who are one trying to start a meetup and how did you make yours uh, so successful so quickly? Um, yeah, so our meetup group really started as a challenge from a mastermind group. Uh, it wasn't really something that we wanted to do. They were just like, Hey, you need to do this. And uh, we we're like, look, we're just going to take a leap of faith and do it. And um, it's a ton of work. It is. Um, we are not a, uh, register RIA group. So I don't um, have to have national speakers. Um, and one of my issues with most of the meetup groups that I always went to is, is they always wanted to sell me something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's probably okay if you're a little bit newer because I was a little bit experienced. It didn't, you know, I just, I don't want to sit there for an hour and get sold something. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so we said, when we, when we start our group, there's going to be zero sales. I mean, literally when you come to my group, I don't have anything to sell you. I mean, I, I'll, I'll sell you, sell you a membership to the group you know, basically house. <laughs> just to cover my costs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But nobody's going to like, even my vendors, um, for the first time I, we let one speak for 30 seconds. And we literally told her like, if you're over 30 seconds, we're going to cut your microphone off because we just, we'd rather everybody come literally get educated, have time to network, um, and get value out of it. Um, so if they want to keep coming back, like the other group that's in our area, um, you know, not to brag on my group, but I think we've done a pretty good job. You know, we've had up to 160 people this year, which is really good. I think for our area, yeah, definitely. Um, and we're typically over a hundred. Um, and, um, somebody asked me like, Hey, what happened to the other group? They only had like 25 people last month. And it's like, well, you know, they're trying to sell you something all the time and, and people just get tired of, you know, yeah you know, here, let me give you a couple nuggets, but pay me nine ninety five if you want anything more sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, we're just a group of like true investors. Like I don't call in, you know, people from out of town. Like I call people that are actually doing deals. They're here. They're, they're, you know, in the weeds, they're real contractors, they're real attorneys. Um, they're just honest people that are laying it out and they're giving back. Um, and people really love that, but it, it's been a lot of work and it's, um, you know, um, it's been difficult for us. There's a lot of people that, and this is a thing that really surprises people. And I, and I told this to somebody at lunch yesterday, like people are really upset that we do this group. They're really upset. And not for the reasons that you would think people are upset because we are educating other investors, how to be successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm here to tell you other people don't want to see you succeed. They don't, you know, they want to keep it all for themselves. Um, and so, you know, part of our business is giving back to, and so the, the group is a good way for us to kind of give back um, and not just us. I mean, we don't speak at the group most of the time. In fact, I prefer not to speak at my own group at all if I don't have to mm-hmm. I prefer it to be other people. Um, but people have a, you know, a different, different mindset and they, um, you know, I, I don't have a scarcity mindset. Like I, I know there's a ton of deals. Um, there's a ton of lenders out there. There's a ton of houses out there. There's a ton of wholesalers, you know, and um, so we do things a little bit different and um, it's helped with the success of the group, but I guess at the same time, it's kind of put a target on our back. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to start a meetup group, just be 
prepared for a lot of work. Um, and, you know, certainly there's benefits, you know, they're not direct, but we've gotten um, some deals out of it. We sold some deals, we've um, bought some deals, um, just a lot of different things. So it's, for us, it's really about the relationships. I don't want your money. Um, it, it costs us a lot of money to run the group because of the size. Yeah. Um, so basically what we charge is kind of to cover our expenses and, and even that doesn't happen, you know, um, a lot of times we even lose on the group, but we just want relationships and I want people to come to me. Um, and I honestly, I don't, other than mastermind groups, which I don't know if you can see, I got my investor fuel shirt on, but I'm in that, uh, mastermind, but I don't, I don't go to any meter meetup groups. I just go to mine and people come and we've gotten a ton out of it. So a lot of value, tons of value. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Yeah. So, um, what, to kind of expand on that point that you said before, uh, because I love what you said about not having a scarcity mindset. Um, can you maybe speak to some of the people who might, you know, be starting out and saying, oh, there's, you know, not enough this, not enough that, not enough money, uh, all of those things to go around? Because, I mean, kind of like you said, you you put a, a huge target on your back by by starting the meetup group. But the thing that I like about it is that you didn't let the fact that there's going to be other people that want to do the same thing you do, uh, stop you from really um, building that meetup. I mean, there's other people out there who might want to go after the same houses you do in the same neighborhoods, you know, kind of at the same <clears throat> price point, but um, you didn't necessarily let that stop you. So can you expand upon that a little bit and how you started to have more of an abundant mindset about investing and networking with other real estate investors who might want to do the same thing you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as an example, um, I mean, you guys know Wayne, Tom, Al Perez, you probably know a lot of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, their businesses are all within probably a mile or two of mine. Um, I think Wayne did 300 deals um, about a year and a half ago, you know, I don't know how many he's doing now. You know, Tom's doing his thing. Al Perez, he's going to rehab 60 to 100 houses. We'll do 100 plus houses. You know, within one to two miles, you know, there's probably, you know, four, five, six companies, guys that are going to do probably more than that, that, you know, guys I don't even know about, mm -hmm. um, that are going to do six, 700 deals. Keep in mind, we're in a small market. I mean, you know, our market, we're not in LA, we're not in Phoenix, you know. <laughs> so you want to talk about abundance, like, every investor is literally like that's big is within two miles of each other. And we all exist and we all do well and we all do different things. Yeah. Um, and when I first started out, like I did driving for dollars, you know, I was knocking on doors. I was making phone calls. I was posting Craigslist ads. You know, I can't do those things anymore. I can't, you know, uh, I'm running a business at scale. We got to send direct mail. We got to do pay-per-click. We have to do, you know, uh, organic web traffic. We have to do relationship stuff. I can't go knock on doors every day. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, but I guarantee you there's lots of houses. If somebody knocked on that door, they'd be knocking off 30, $40,000 deals because I did them all day, every day. You know, I, my first year I started this, I did it 10 months. We did like almost three quarters of a million dollars gross. I spent like no money on marketing. It can be done. Um, so as far as deals being out there, they're there. People just tell themselves they're not there. They're not, they're not working hard enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, speaking to kind of the uh, abundance mindset, like um, there's just so many houses there's so many opportunities. Um, we're, we're, we're not even hitting even close to what's out there. Um, so it's easy to get caught up in the, Hey, there's no deals. Hey, I'm not getting anything. Um, you just got to keep looking. You got to keep grinding. You got to keep trying. You got to keep networking. It pays off. It does pay off. There's, there's times where, uh, you know, we've gone through a month and it's like, man, we, you know, we got deals and we didn't even make any money. Um, you know, we rehab stuff and you just got to keep pushing forward. Um, it is tough though. It definitely is. Um, you know, I'm, I know you guys do some multifamily stuff, you know, Man, I mean, how do you compete against hedge funds that have a hundred million dollars that can buy an apartment complex? I don't know, but they can't look yep. at everything. <laughs> you can't look at everything they can, right? Like they're very institutionalized. So just like my business is very structured, I have to, 
I have to, you know, throw out X amount of dollars to get X amount or, you know, Y amount of leads back. I have to do certain things to get that because I, I, ru I run in a certain box. But so, you know, I may be able to find certain houses that you can't, but you can definitely find a bunch that I can't. Same thing with multifamily, same thing with lenders, same thing with everything. So just work where your niche is and be good at where you're at. Don't try to be the best at everything. Um, and just work that as best as you can and as hard as you can. And, you know, you'll, you'll get deals. They're there. For sure. There. So uh, for someone that wants to get started with wholesaling, what's like the top thing that they need to know or something that they need to do to become successful at it? So I think the thing that I see wholesalers fail at the most is understanding what a deal is. So they don't, um, they don't understand what it looks like. And, and usually I think in my opinion, it's because they don't understand comps or ARV, whatever you want to call it. And they're way off on the rehab, right? Like, and I'm sure you guys see these deals, you know, it's like, Hey, $200,000. Yeah. I mean, we all, we've all been there, right? Like $200,000 ARV and you know, $5,000 in paint carpet. And you know, it's like a 4,000 square foot house. And it's like, yeah, you, you know, it ain't gonna work, you know, like, <laughs> um, so what I tell a lot of wholesalers is, is, you know, maybe, you know, find an investor, find a mentor, find a contractor, somebody that you can kind of learn some of the numbers, understand the numbers and what a deal looks like, the mechanics of it, the contracts and all that good sort of stuff. That's easy. You know, you can hire an attorney, you can have a title company help you, you can have a friend help you. Those are all pretty easy things. Mm -hmm. The yeah. numbers, the, you know, understanding what it really costs people to rehab houses. You know, we, we have the same thing. Like when people sell us houses, they're like, oh, you're going to spend like, you know, $10,000 and this house is going to look like on HGTV. And in my head, like, I know it's going to cost me $50,000. And that's not like some BS number. Like it's a real number. Like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Only rehabbing houses cost 50 to 60,000, you know, but people think it's like 10. And, um, I think wholesalers, because they don't know their numbers and they're eager to do a deal, they put stuff under contract that they can't get done and is never going to happen because they just want to pacify the seller and they want to, they want to make money and they want to help them. And then they end up just hurting them more um, because they can't get it sold because it was never a deal to start with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so know your numbers, do deals that make sense. Even if it means you have to find a mentor and give up half your assignment fee or what, you know, whatever, like, um, maybe it'd be better than just more direct advice. Just find a mentor to work with. Find somebody who's already doing deals. You know, it's going to be yeah. less painful to have a mentor just is. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think to that point, um, it, it really comes down to product knowledge. And mm -hmm. in my opinion, because my product knowledge in multifamily and commercial is I've noticed is a little bit better than what it is in like single family homes, especially if, you know, in regards to like wholesaling something, mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of people don't necessarily focus on. And I seen at your meetup, everybody who goes up in front of the, in front of the meetup and they speak, whether it's you, Adrian, or, you know, some other people, mm -hmm. they are an absolute expert on their product you know, how much it, it's going to take to fix it up mm -hmm. and um, who's going to buy it, what they're going to want in it when they do buy it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, uh, to your point, people need to pay a lot more attention to because, like, I feel like you can't necessarily run a business if you or at least your partner or somebody you work with don't necessarily understand a product. And I feel like um, that was kind of like my shortfall when I first started in real estate mm -hmm. but as time progressed I got better at it but it's something that like you go to these you know three-day workshops or you know these gurus and they don't necessarily teach on that and it's like honestly I would say it's one of the most important parts because if if you don't know the product you don't know what's going to move that product you don't know what's going to make it attractive to an end buyer whether that end buyer is a fix and flipper or like a person who's just buying it to actually live in or rent it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in the last deal that we done, it, we, we paid so much more 
attention to just the product where you know where it's placed you know well what's the kitchen like now as opposed to where we're taking it Mm -hmm. and it it's i feel like it's so important and i I don't hear enough people kind of talk about the product specifically and that's why i like when you had uh i think it was al perez there okay because he knew that product like like the back of his hand and i think that's something that if a lot of wholesalers would spend a little bit more time than that because the the math is easy you know enough but if you spent a little bit more time on you know what's a kitchen cost what's a bathroom cost you know all of these different things i feel like a lot of people would be a lot better off yeah i mean to your point you know for like for us when we're wholesaling our product is a house so we know our product and then we know who wants that product and that's what's made us really strong like when we send out a deal to buyers, we already know who's buying it. I mean, we pretty much know who's going to buy it. Yeah. We're just sending it out as a formality. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, but the reality is, is even if you have a huge buyers list, you know, you know, thousands of people that are that are like cash buyers, like you know, it's the same people pretty much that buy most of the time. So, like in my head, when we send out a deal, we know our product and our in our you know our customer really because a buyer is a customer we know it so well that we're like, we already know this person's going to bid on it. We know what they're going to pay for it. And so, you know, to your point, know your product, know your customer, whatever that is, you know, it's different in everybody's real estate business, but if they worked more on that, then, you know, all the little minutia of everything that get it done, like I think people would be more successful. Yeah, for sure. And another question I wanted to ask is because we mentioned private money and I don't know if we've uh, talked about that in any type of depth in our past podcasts. Um, I'm always interested to hear most people's first um, interaction with private money, because a lot of people, you know, they get into real estate and I've even said this, you know, when I was first getting started, like, Oh, you know, if I just had the money or I just had the capital, you know, the things that you can do, and I've grown to find out that the capital is out there, mm-hmm. but um, one, it takes knowledge to access it. And two, it takes like a, a certain amount of confidence because if you're not confident in yourself and your business, you know, nobody else is going to want to um, sure. you know, mess with you or, or anything like that. So what was kind of your first, uh, the first time, the first situation where you utilize private capital? So in my case with my uh, former business partner, it was a little bit easier because um, his family had money and believed in us and was willing to take a chance on us. Um, most of his family was in some sort of trades, whether it be roofing or something like that. So yep. they kind of understood what we did. Um, so when we started rehabbing houses, they were willing to loan money and it's a little bit easier to borrow money from friends and family. Yeah. Because they know you, you have a relationship with them. Um, they're going to take a chance on you, maybe if somebody even shouldn't, uh, you know, because you know, because they have a relationship. You know, you just I, I don't I don't treat and and I'm and I'm a private lender too, but I don't loan money to people um, as easily if I don't know them and I don't have a long term relationship and I'm comfortable with them. The same way I do is, um, you know, I mean, I have friends that are like, hey we're going to sheriff sale. We're floating 10 houses right now. Can you loan us a hundred grand? We need it for three days till we close um, something else. And you know, those are the type of relationships. You just go and get them a check. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's how comfortable I am with some of the people that I borrow and loan to. Um, but at the start of it, it was friends and family. Yeah. That's not always so easy um, because not everybody has friends or family with money. Mm-hmm. Um, so although that worked for me, it's not going to work for everybody. Yeah. So what I would say is if you have a deal and you're looking for money, um, then you're going to have to be willing to give up a little bit more and find a partner because they're going to be more of a partner than a lender. Um, so that may look a little bit different depending on the deal, whether they're putting in some work, um, you know, some sweat equity with you to try to get you through it, or if they're just putting up the money and, and you know, they're kind of taking a gamble on you. So they want a little bit more, but I, done plenty of deals where I gave up 40, 50% of the profit, which was a sizable amount of money, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because 40 or 50% of something is better than a hundred percent of nothing. And really what, what I did is I proved myself to that lender, 
you know, I proved myself that we could do it. I proved to myself, uh, or I proved to them that, um, you know, I was trustworthy with the money and that I was going to respect them and their money, um, and how hard they had worked for it. Like we all work really hard for our money. You don't, you know, so like with our private lenders and people I loan to, like, I just expect that they, they really respect that money and don't, they're not reckless with it. Um, that they think things out. Um, so when you're starting out trying to get money, just be organized, you know, um, with your lenders, you know, respect their money as if it was your own. Like, how would you feel if you lost a hundred grand? Like, would it change your life? Would you know, like, you know, for some people it would, some people it wouldn't, but you know, anybody would be pissed though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not happy, right? Like, even if you got a lot of money, people lose a hundred grand. They're not happy. Yeah, all right. Um, like, you know, we're very careful making sure that, you know, uh, you know, you know, we have a lender or something, you know, their name is on our insurance policy as a mortgage, you know, as, as the person who we've mortgaged that property to, um, we're making sure that, you know, things are done properly. The paperwork's done properly. The, you know, maybe a note mortgage is recorded on the property. Um, because we res you know, we respect their money and, and do things the right way. Um, the organization is part of it, but yeah, I mean, man, if, a, if you're at the start and you have like no track record, um, and you don't have any friends and family or anybody that's, you know, trusting of you, you better find somebody with some money that is going to mentor you or be a partner with you. And, you know, just remember, you know, you're getting a ton of experience and you're still going to make money. So don't worry about giving up some of that profit, you know, because if, because if nobody will take a chance on you, then you're not gonna make any money. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, uh, to that point, I've, I've noticed that when, once you've got that first, raise or that first deal out mm -hmm. the way, once you got that first deal funded like people trust you like way way more you know oh, yeah. not like you actually have at least one or two proofs of uh concept so like you know you can even be in a situation and i've thought about this i haven't necessarily done it yet but be in a situation where you just partner with somebody who is great at raising money and mm -hmm. it is their actual job in, mm -hmm. in your partnership to raise the capital and then yep. you do everything else. And um, that project could be used as, you know, validity to you because you were included in the deal. So like your next deal, you could be like, oh, well, I didn't raise the money, but um, my partner raised the money and this is how we actually did the deal. This is how it was mm -hmm. And really, uh, like, everyone says, you know, in order for somebody to do a transaction with you, they should know, like, and trust you. And building that, you know, trust, uh, credibility is a really, really big part of that, I think. Yeah, I mean, I know, especially in multifamily, you know, people are always raising money. And it's not uncommon to have a guy that just kind of works on, you know, the raise portion of it, and a guy that's kind of doing the underwriting. And, you know, um, and, you know, I call that I call the, the money raising guy, the hype man, you know, he's, yeah, he's the relationship guy. He's the guy, you know, he may not understand the mechanics of the deal. And, and so you need a, you know, kind of pencil pusher on the other end to yeah, for sure. kind of rein it all in. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. So um, we talked about abundance all throughout the podcast. Um, so just to wrap it up we want to ask you, how do you spread abundance? Yeah, so we, um, we try to give as much of our time as possible. Um, that's a really easy one um, for us because it doesn't cost you anything. You know, there's no dollar coming out of your pocket to give some time to somebody. Um, and, and, that, and, that, and that's different things for different people. Um, sometimes it's, it's us volunteering, um, our, our meetup group, um, in December, and this is just a you know easy example for us. Like we make the event free; nobody pays anything. Um, we just ask that you know everybody brings like um, some non-perishable food items or a gift card. Um, and if you don't, you're an investor. Then we're probably going to shame you in front of everybody. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, so if you come to my meetup group in 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 December, be prepared with things in hand, or we're going to be mean to you. Uh, and that's just one of the things like, you know, especially, you know, in December, it's just one of those times we just kind of reflect and, you know, just thankful for everything that we've been blessed with and um, try to uh, take some time to, you know, help some people in need. Mm -hmm. That's one way. Um, 
know, the last couple of years, we've done some different um, personal and business challenges uh, with our company. Um, last year, we had some personal challenges and everybody kind of set a personal goal. And um, if they hit it, they got to give a pretty sizable amount of money to a charity of their choosing. And um, ironically, pretty much everybody hit the uh, personal goals for the charity but the business goals, which were actually money for themselves, we didn't really do as good with. Uh, so people ironically worked harder on personal goals to give money to somebody else than business stuff wow. for themselves, right? So that, I mean, that says a lot. Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, I lost over 70 pounds myself in about 90 days. That was awesome. Yeah, that is. She didn't recognize you the last time we met for coffee. <laughs> I was like, that's Justin. She's like, no stuff. <laughs> now, to be fair, I put a few of those back on, and I've been going back to the gym again for about the last couple of weeks. Uh, but, you know, we just, we do different things. Um, we're just really grateful for everything um, that we've been blessed with. We've come a long ways in a short amount of time, and, um, you know, even my former business partner, somebody asked me the other day, like kind of why we split and it was because the business changed and things. And, you know, like I told him, if, if his family and, and his friends hadn't taken a chance on us financially, I don't know if I'd be where I am today. You know, they loaned us a lot of money and they took chances on us. Um, and there's just so many people that have, you know, really helped me get to where I am today. Um, that I'm just really grateful and try to give back wherever I can. You know, it, it's a little difficult because, you know, we get a lot of uh, requests. Hey, can you help mentor me? Hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do that? And there's just not enough time in the day. I mean, I have three kids and a wife. Um, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I, I, I went to go say I have a social life, but I don't have a social life. Like yeah. I work and I have family. That's, I mean, I don't know. That's, you know, the truth. Uh, but we're just really busy. Um, so I probably lean towards giving back financially because that's a little bit easier for me, but really just try to, uh, you know, find different ways to, you know, live abundantly and, and give back to others and, um, you know, getting better with that every year. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So uh, the last question we have is we know that somebody is probably going to listen to this podcast and, you know, they may be a private money lender or they may be a fix and flipper and want to get onto your buyers list or whatever the case may be, they may want to transact with you. So my question is how can somebody get in contact with you? Yeah. So I'll give you uh, my personal cell phone number. It's uh, 219-237-0415. Um, I get a lot of calls. So texts are probably better. Awesome. Um, seems kind of non-personal, but text me and, I'll yeah, yeah. You and then we can talk on the phone. Um, you know, if they want to check out the meetup group, it's, uh, invest NWI for Northwest Indiana group.com. Um, check out the group. First time people are free. After that, you can get a membership. Um, there's no obligation to come check it out. Uh, glad to have you guys there. If you want to come, if you got any questions, you know, about wholesaling or the group or, you know, need some help with stuff or whatever, feel free to, you know, call or text me and I'll help as much as I can. Uh, we're always looking for more deals. Um, we're all looking for deals. Yeah. Um, I'm also looking for deals I can loan money on at times. Uh, Adrian and I are both private lenders as well. We have self-directed IRA, so we're loaning money. Um, so I'm always coming in and out of deals. So I would love to look at your private lending deals, whether it's, you know, commercial, multifamily, residential, I loan on a little bit of everything. Um, risky stuff. We'll do bridge loans. We'll do, um, same day transactional funding, whatever you got, I'll take a look at it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Excellent. Awesome. Nice having you on, Justin. We really. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you guys having me. So that's all we have for today, folks. I hope you got as much value out of this as we did. Keep in mind, the only way we can improve is through constructive feedback. So remember to rate and review this episode. Also, you are not the only person that needs to know this super valuable information. So be sure to subscribe and share as well. Stay tuned for the next episode. And remember to always spread abundance. Peace.